Hello everyone, welcome to MC 100 week seven. This week we'll be going over chapter eight, which is about the newspaper industry. Now the newspaper industry, of course, has seen a lot of changes in recent years, but it is the birth of modern journalism in America. I worked for a journalist for over 12 years primarily in the broadcast sector, but I did a lot of print journalism as well and continue to teach that here at the University of Montevallo. However, we do teach convergent media practice uh, for our journalists now because, as you know, the newspaper industry has seen a sharp decline in many years, and so it's important for journalists to be well-rounded, to be able to write for print, digital, and broadcast. But in order to truly understand how journalism got to where it is today, it's important for us to look at the development of newspapers, both historically and in terms of today's industry. So we will be doing just that. Newspapers are an important part of culture in America. First, they chronicle daily life. They are written records of what goes on every single moment in our country. That doesn't mean everything that goes on is written about. Of course, it is very socialized in terms of the topics that journalists cover. However, it provides a really good overview of what has happened uh, not only today, but in uh, years past. So we can see the development of our country through newspapers. Now, newspapers are meant to both inform and entertain. Of course, current uh, modern journalists really struggle with this dichotomy of being public servants that are meant to help inform the public while still trying to keep businesses afloat. And so that's why we have to pass back and forth between information that helps the public, but entertainment that the public wants to read. Now, newspapers also have the ability to shape cultural trends. Research has shown that what is written about in newspapers tend to set the agenda for what is popular socially, politically, economically, and really then those trends continue to shape what is in newspapers. And so it's a, the cyclical effect where what is written about in media tends to affect the agenda of our country. And then the agenda of our, of our country continues to feed into the media cycle. Now, one of the primary roles for journalists is to be a watchdog of the government. And we have seen many times where newspaper writers have been able to point out injustices in our government and work to correct them. They can also trigger debates because you're providing more information to the public, which uh, is meant to be objective in its American uh, professional norm of objectivity. Uh, and so by informing the public, it allows people to debate each other on their beliefs based on that shared information. Now, of course, we've seen the model of objectivity change over time, but we will discuss that a little bit later. Another function of newspapers is to provide advice, such as columnists like Dear Abby. Uh, they can also be fun. They can be humorous because comics um, are often printed in newspapers and have been a part of American journalism since early uh, colonial times. And uh, they can either be funny, like your Garfield or Peanuts comics, but they can also be political and make statements. Now, of course, Newspapers also provide a ritualization of culture, especially when we used to have printed papers that were delivered every day. You would have people from different communities, different cities all across the nation, all following the same ritual and routine every morning, getting the paper, uh, drinking your morning coffee while you read the same news that people all across the nation are reading. Now, of course, that has changed as more information become uh, channels become available, but you still have some of those rituals in daily life. And as we talked about, it does set the media agenda by shaping cultural trends. Now, of course, we have seen a large shift in newspapers from digital and mobile, uh, where newspapers have uh, created this offspring of digital communication 
And really it was newspapers that drove the shift to digital and mobile journalism, uh, which we will explore further. But despite the claims that print is dead, that is not really true. Print still has a very wide influence in our culture. And so it is important to study newspapers, even if you are not a newspaper reader yourself. Now, the first written news that we are aware of historically uh, was developed by Julius Caesar, and it was actually a public post uh, in 59 BC that uh, just gave the information of the time of what was happening in Rome. Um, and so this is our first knowledge of a written communication, but of course, this isn't what we would consider mass media because just one written news uh, plaque is not enough to get around to a large amount of people. So instead we can look at uh, American journalism and the first North American newspaper was actually the public occurrences, both foreign and domestic in, in 1690. It was published in Boston by Ben Harris and it was very short lived. In fact, it was banned after just one issue because the newspaper took a negative tone towards the British rule and uh, printed a very scandalous story about Francis King having an affair. And so it was a very short lived publication, but one that would kind of set the stage for American journalism. In 1704, the first regularly published paper uh, began. The Boston Newsletter was published by John Campbell. It was mainly uh, filled with dull news of what happened in Europe the month prior, but it was able to communicate those events to a larger public. Uh, in terms of local news, uh, they might cover illnesses, public flogging, suicides, things like that, but it was primarily news from Europe uh, that was over a month old by the time it had been published. In 1721, we have two brothers who really create uh, some of the most memorable colonial newspapers, the New England Current in Boston, which was produced by Ben Franklin's older brother, James. These stories were some of the first to appeal to ordinary readers. Instead of uh, really writing for high class, affluent uh, leaders in our country, the New England Current was really written for the everyday man. In 17 1929, uh, Ben got a little uh, sibling rivalry and decided to start his own paper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, and historians consider this the best colonial newspaper because of its ability to go out and report original news. Um, it's really one of the key examples of how American early journalism really shaped the way that we think of journalism today. It was also one of the first to include advertising for products within a newspaper in order to create revenue for the product. And uh, the newspaper also took subsidies from political parties, which meant that they really could not uh, anger the members of the political parties that they were taking money from. In 1733, the New York Weekly Journal was printed by John Peter Zinger. Uh, it was uh, with the popular party and it opposed British rule. Um, and so it was a key part of the American Revolution. In 1734, Zinger was actually arrested for criticizing the royal governor of New York. Uh, he was arrested and charged with seditious libel, which a libel is defaming a public official's character in print. Zinger's lawyer was Andrew Han Hamilton. You may know of him. Uh, and the verdict was in that um, uh, American newspapers have the right to criticize government leaders as long as the reports are true. And so it was really the basis for the First Amendment, which of course was passed in 1791. So you can see how these uh, early cases of American legal um, journalism cases were able to kind of shape the way that the press was able to work in the legal system later on. Here's a rendering of the courtroom, and I think Hamilton's uh, concluding remarks kind of set the tone for what journalism was meant to look like in America. The question before the court and you gentlemen at the jury is not of small or private concern. It is not the cause of one poor printer, nor of New York alone, which you are now trying. No, it may in its consequence affect every free man that lives under a British government on the main of America. It is the best cause. It is the cause of liberty. 
And this, again, kind of points to the idea that journalism in America was meant to point to freedom. It was um, created on the basis of a free press even before we were officially formed as a nation. Now, early newspapers, uh, there were very few uh, in the beginning, of course. In 1765, there were 30 papers in the colonies. It wasn't until 1784 that we get our first daily paper. And the largest of these papers only had a circulation of 1,500 people. The readership tended to be very wealthy people who were interested in politics or business. And there were really two types of press. The first was the partisan press, and the agenda of those journalists was for whomever was paying the bills. It was for the party that would subsidize the paper. And this kind of is what the editorial system of uh, modern journalism is based on this partisan press. Uh, commercial press, on the other hand, uh, was focused on business leaders who were interested in economics. And uh, this really created a lot of the business journalism that we see today. Now the Penny Press was really a turning point in American journalism history. In the late 1820s, a paper cost about six cents and a yearly subscription would be about 10 or $12, which was a week's salary for most people. So newspapers at that time could really be uh, uh, only afforded by the very affluent upper class. With the Industrial Revolution, however, and the uh, increasing technology for printing that we discussed in our chapter about books, um, the improved printing allowed newspapers to be printed at a lower cost. It also increased literacy of the middle class. And so 4,000 papers could be printed per hour. It made them cheaper to produce. And that's how we get penny papers. Penny papers uh, were a penny. They cost a penny when they came out. Um, and so they became more affordable for the everyday person. While there were some subscriptions to the penny press, it was mainly known for street sales. You know, extra, extra, read all about it. Uh, the newsboys that would stand on uh, the street and shout the day's headlines to get someone to pick up a paper were really some of the greatest advocates for American journalism because it allowed for an era of newspapers as a mass medium that wasn't just for the elite class, it was also for the everyday man. Now in 1833, we have the New York Sun. Its uh, motto was, it shines for all. Benjamin Day was its publisher and it didn't have any subscriptions. It was one of the first American newspapers that did not require subscription. You could buy it for a penny. Um, the stories that appeared in the New York Sun were local. They focused on scandals or things that were of entertaining interest uh, and a lot of police reports and crime. Uh, the New York Sun also included serialized stories or stories that would appear in segments or various articles over time about celebrities like Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone. They also included a lot of human interest stories, daily trials, ordinary people who had some extraordinary circumstance happened to them. And it's really the kind of local journalism that we see um, being pushed out now. Um, in just six months of it being published, the circulation of the New York Sun was over 8,000, which was twice its largest competitor. Um, the only problem with the New York Sun they tended to make up a lot of stories because of their focus on sensationalism. So we don't really have the uh, true objectivity and elite journalism that, that we would hope for. In fact, here's one of their made up stories. It's an infamous uh, story in, in American journalism history called The Inhabitants of the Moon. Uh, the New York Sun made up a doctor who was working with a very well-known astronomer at the time who, and they were claiming that this doctor had found life on the moon. And so they were documenting all of the various villages on the moon, the types of people that lived there, the culture of the moon. And of course, this was all made up. In 1835, we have the New York Herald. Uh, James Gordon Bennett became the first U.S. press baron. Uh, he freed journalism from political parties and focused more on the middle and working class readers. 
Uh, they had many different beats, but because of their focus on the middle and working class, they tended to focus on crime, uh, political essays, scandals, business sections. They started to include letters sections, so letters to the editor and other um, types of community journalism. They had uh, beats about fashion, sports, religion, society gossip, and of course, once the Civil War hit, uh, that became a major story for the newspaper as well. By 1860, they had a circulation of nearly 80,000, uh, and so it was, of course, the largest daily at the time. Now, as uh, mass media continued to emerge, it shifted the economic base of newspapers to advertising. Uh, there were a lot of newspapers that were placing ads disguised as consumer news, and so uh, the newspaper had to be very neutral towards advertisers, um, and they would print almost anything. If you would pay them to put an ad in the paper, it would appear. Uh, by 1848, there were six papers that formed the Associated Press, which became a very large part of American journalism. The Associated Press is still in existence today, and they provide access to stories through a newswire service. The original Associated Press relayed stories rapidly via telegraph, and so they would send reporters to different areas like Washington or sites of the Civil War, and those reporters would file their reports by telegraph, and then the Associated Press would send out that one story to a bunch of papers so that all of these papers had access to national news. Uh, the Associated Press is, of course, still in existence, although they don't use telegraphs, shocking. Um, but you can see how it worked here in this image. You have a reporter sitting on the right um, reporting using a telegraph. Um, and it was really uh, the true emergence of newspapers as mass media. Now, Pulitzer, um, was uh, a very famous uh, newspaper publisher. He published uh, The New York World. Uh, Pulitzer and The New York World focused on plain writing style, which was uh, very widely adopted in American journalism. But they were one of the first to include maps and illustrations within their work. They focused heavily on crime and sex, but they realized that women who stayed at home could be a large form of readership, and so they included advice in women's pages. Most of the advertisers for New York World were department stores who were seeking to target those uh, stay-at-home women. Uh, but they had a contradictory spirit. Uh, Pulitzer prided himself on his reporters uh, covering social causes and uncovering corruption. However, there were still many manufactured stories and in fact, staged stunts. Uh, so Nellie Bly, who is the woman uh, pictured in this uh, newspaper article was one of their reporters, which of course having a female reporter at the time was unheard of. Um, but they produced this stunt where she traveled around the world faster than Jules Verne and would report on all of her different journeys um, in the paper. Now, of course, uh, you probably recognize the name Pulitzer from the Pulitzer Prize, which is awarded for journalism, literature, drama, and music. And uh, Pulitzer also created a graduate school of journalism at Columbia University. Now, his competitor, Hearst, uh, who is also well known within the journalism industry, created the paper, The New York Journal. Uh, Hearst was very sneaky and went and hired many members of Pulitzer's staff to start his own paper. In fact, he even hired gangsters to deliver paper to make sure that uh, the readership would pay out. The New York Journal was known for sensational stories, but it would appeal to immigrants by using large headlines and bold layouts that were easy to read and easy to take in. They were very well known, however, for inventing interviews, faking pictures, and encouraging conflicts. Uh, in fact, uh, Hearst once said, the modern editor does not care about the facts, the editor wants novelty. Uh, Hearst was the model for Charles Foster Kane in the movie Citizen Kane, um, and that is a wonderful movie, classic movie about American journalism that if you haven't seen, you should. 
Uh, Hearst became one of the largest media businesses in the world. By 1930, they owned 40 daily and Sunday papers. Uh, they owned 13 magazines, eight radio stations, and two film companies, including uh, Good Housekeeping, Cosmopolitan, and many of the large papers. In fact, Hearst is still a company. They own one of the TV stations here in Birmingham and uh, they are a large media conglomerate. Now, modern uh, journalism really was driven in the late 1800s. There was a real dichotomy between story-driven news, which was yellow and penny press, where it really didn't matter what the facts were, it was all about entertainment, versus the uh, objective, just the facts type of reporting. So a lot of work went into understanding the need for objectivity within journalism and how that would be created. Well, the New York Times was a major influencer in that. Uh, Adolf Ochs in 1896 began the New York Times. He wanted it to be a no frills paper. It was meant to be informational, just the facts, ma'am. And they appealed to the affluent and educated people again. Uh, in 1989, uh, he lowered the price down to a penny and circulation boomed and made it one of the most popular papers in America. The uh, objective modern journalist was known for the inverted pyramid style. Uh, it was so popular because it allowed editors to cut at each of those lines if there wasn't enough uh, space in the layout of the publication to allow for additional room. And it uh, also made it very easy for reporters to go out and know how to write the story. However, the problem is that many journalists criticized the inverted pyramid style and continue to do so for being too cookie cutter. It's kind of copy and paste journalism. And it lacks kind of the art of writing that, that the early American journalist had. However, the inverted pyramid style is still the preferred method of writing, uh, particularly for print media. And so it is important that you recognize that a lot of that came from the 1800s and the New York Times style writing. Now, after World War I, we start getting more into interpretive journalism, which uh, explains key issues within a historical and social context. Uh, Walter Lippmann suggests that there are three responsibilities of the press to make a record of what's going on in our lives, to analyze it and provide understanding for it, and then um, basing their information off of their analysis and the current record, journalists should then suggest plans for how to make it better. Um, and so this argument about whether journalists should just report the news as straight facts or be able to provide editorial opinion uh, really came to a head with uh, the 1930s, with the depression and threats uh, from the Nazis. And uh, so political columns and op-eds became very popular during this time because journalists were really seeking to extend their role to analysis. This also, um, really inspired a lot of radio analysis that uh, kind of grew the industry. Uh, it used to be at the beginning of the 1930s and even prior to that, uh, radio host would actually sit down and just read straight from a newspaper. Uh, for their facts. And uh, newspapers often sued radio stations for just reading their information and stealing their profits. But it paved the way um, for radio announcers to become um, analysts of the news that they were reading. And it is kind of how the talking head analysis that we know today on cable, radio talk shows, podcasts, political shows, um, that was really the birth of that movement. Literary journalism uh, became a lot more popular in the 1960s. This is also known as new journalism, and it uses the techniques of creative writing or fiction writing and uh, using it for reporting. So it mixes content and form similar to Mark Twain's writing in the 19th century. Uh, if you've ever read a Rolling Stones article, you know, it uses a lot of narrative. It, it 
a lot of descriptors, opinions, you know, things like that. Um, so it allows for longer features, especially for cultural and social issues, which is why, of course, in the 1960s, it became a lot more popular. There was an attack on objectivity in 1960 as people were realizing that there is no one truth in life, that people can have many different opinions and all still be correct. Um, and so you can't see um, just one fact. You really have to be able to take in all sides and journalists really weren't doing that prior to the 1960s. Journalists were also relying very heavily on sources of power, such as the president or other government officials. And so advocacy journalism was really born in an effort to become a watchdog of cultural and social issues, such as racism or women's equality, things like that. Um, precision journalism was also heavily used in the 1960s. This is the use of scientifically accurate information to tell stories such as data jur journalism, polls, questionnaires, resource reporting during elections, things of that nature. I'm sure you've seen a lot of it uh, during COVID-19. So data journalism really uh, grew in the 1960s as a reaction uh, to objectivity and not being as heavily bought into in the field anymore. Now, online journalism, of course, has changed the game for print newspapers. Uh, the Drudge Report was a, a major influence in online journalism. It really breaks journalists from that front page mindset and forces them to think about uh, journalism in new ways. And we will, of course, discuss uh, digital journalism and in, in future lessons, but it's important to realize that the um, real grandfather of digital journalism was newspapers. And um, it was really a lot of these particular events like the BP oil spill or Occupy Wall Street that gave birth to the digital newspaper online journalism movement. So now that we've talked a little bit more about the history of newspapers, I want you to go into your discussion board and talk about newspaper readership and why you believe that newspaper readership declines and think about new models and new ways that might be able to support new journalism models. You can then watch the video on modern journalism models. That doesn't make sense. Those should be back.